So we just arrived at West Virginia University and we wanted to find some data that already existed so we could get working on a project straight away. So we kind of like bandied around some ideas for good projects and one of the things we thought of was reanalyzing the data from an old survey taken like in the late 1990s um, of the small Magellanic Cloud and the large Magellanic Cloud to look for pulsars that had been missed before. The project involved painstakingly searching hundreds of data points, work Duncan delegated to a student. Every week, my student would come to me um, with the results of his analysis from the, the previous week, and sometimes those would be known pulsars, sometimes we'd see sources of interference or just noise. Um, but one week, I remember it very clearly, he came to me and uh, showed me this uh, plot with a signal that was so bright uh, and apparently so far away that it was completely unlike anything we'd ever seen before. So this is the plot that my student David um, brought to me. And you can see straight away, this is the pulse that he found, this big dark feature here. What you're looking at is a graph of telescope time along the horizontal axis. So this is almost two hours of, of observation here. And on the vertical axis is basically distance. And you can see the background of noise from the telescope and the sky, these little dots here. So this feature really stands out because it's so bright uh, and so far up the, uh, the plot here, which indicates that it's a bright source that's very, very far away. Quite frankly, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, yet it had all the hallmarks of a signal that was coming from deep space. The signal, or fast radio burst Duncan had discovered, became affectionately known as the Lorimer Burst. Scientists have been searching the cosmos for strange signals like the Lorimer Burst for more than 50 years, ever since a secretive meeting took place in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. There had been, over the years, a, a lot of claims of sightings of extraterrestrials, colonies on the moon. The subject had gotten to be treated with contempt, really. It was considered almost taboo. But in 1961, Frank Drake held a conference behind closed doors in this room at the Green Bank Observatory. The National Academy of Sciences of the United States, a very eminent body, asked me to convene a meeting of all the people I knew of in the world who were actually serious thinkers in the subject. And I invited them all, all 12 of them. The group called themselves the Order of the Dolphin. The purpose of the meeting was to estimate how many extraterrestrial civilizations might be out there using what's become known as the Drake Equation. So we start out with the rate of star formation, which you write R sub star. Of course, the more stars, the more planets there will be, the more possibilities for life. We multiply that by the fraction of stars which actually have planets, and then again by the number of habitable planets in each system. We then multiply this by the fraction on which life develops, and then by the fraction by which intelligence appears, and then by the fraction of those which actually give a detectable technology, one we might detect across the great distances between the stars. What we have now in these six factors is the rate of production of detectable civilizations. Well, how many are there? This rate times the average time that these civilizations remain detectable. For two days, the group worked out best guess values for each step in Frank's equation. We will continue to be ready. The answer we came to for the value of n was n equals about 10,000 
detectable civilizations at present in our galaxy, the Milky Way. It became clear to us that it was very likely that there were radio signals from other worlds passing through the room in which we were sitting and which we could detect if we but pointed our telescopes in the right direction and tuned to the right frequency. At the time of the meeting, Frank thought he knew exactly what channel to listen into. What we needed was a special place in the universe where civilizations might contact. And we realized it wasn't a place, but it was a radio channel. The most common element in the universe is hydrogen. It happens to transmit a, a very beautiful signal at a certain frequency when it's in its lowest energy state. And we decided that might be the, the place you meet your friends when you can't arrange in advance where to meet. So we decided to search at the hydrogen wavelength. There were two purposes to the Arecibo message. One was to demonstrate that it was possible to send a message across the interstellar space uh, that would be detectable and decodable, understandable. The other was simply to show that we had in fact reached the state where we ourselves could do this sort of thing. There were probably 200 people there. They were sitting in chairs on the edge of the big giant dish and um, we tell them we're about ready to send and they steered the telescope. The whole great big thing starts moving, which is in itself is very impressive. This giant thing is moving, and uh, you just have the sense that something spectacular is going on. I will play the tape for you. This is a recording made in the control room of the Arecibo radio telescope at the time in November of 1974 when we sent a message to the stars. That steady tone you hear is the sound of the transmitter being turned on. It's simply sending out a signal without any information on it to call attention to itself so that people who capture this will know that something is coming. And here it comes. That sort of warbling sound you hear is actually a sequence of 10 characters per second being sent out with those characters being on two slightly different radio frequencies. When you listen to the sound, you had the impression that there was a story being told here. And when it finally ends, everybody was crying on the actual occasion. It was just um, <clears throat> the uh, sense that this great big machine was talking to another world. The message goes to 300,000 stars, so there's a good chance, actually. <laughs> recipient of the Arecibo message is a galaxy 25,000 light years away. But the 50,000 years it would take for the message to get there and for any reply to journey back to Earth is far beyond the lifespan of any single human. Perhaps even longer than the lifespan of civilization itself.